Hi, I'm Kemil and this is Kem with Kem. This is an adaptation of an online session. Now, the topics we're covering here are the lesson topics. The lesson topics are simple distillation, fractional distillation, and the extraction of sucrose from sugarcane. Now, if you find value in this um, lesson or this session, be sure to like, also share with a friend, and be sure to check out all the other materials that we have on this channel. Now, we hope that you enjoy. As I said earlier, please leave a comment, leave a feedback to let us know how we can tweak things to actually better cater to you. All right. So, couple later, have fun. All right, so we're picking up from yesterday. We started looking at simple distillation yesterday. We drew a diagram, but we ran out of time. So we're gonna just um, cover what um, the information that goes with the diagram. Then we're going to look at how simple distillation is different from fractional distillation. We have a diagram to draw as well. And uh, we want to also look at the extraction of sucrose from sugarcane. And in this process, you'll see that, well, I want you to identify all the, um, the, other separate, the separating techniques that you see being employed in that process. All right. So this is where we're kicking off. So simple distillation or diagram. Well, it wasn't this very one, but it looks something like this, where we have our distillation flask and it's been heated. The solution boils. Let me... See if I can get a spotlight. Okay, that's, that, that's requiring too much. The solution boils and the solvent vapors rise up in the flask. They, well, the only escape route there is that little, um, that, I don't even know what to call it, that, that neck, that, 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 that hose or that tube. And it goes, if, if you follow the, um, if you follow the journey, Right, so we, we were looking at the, 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 the idea yesterday that um, the vapor is, is enclosed in this condenser, this Liebig condenser that cools it. And this has a little more information. So the solvent vapor passes through the condenser where it is cooled, causing it to condense. Water in the condenser flows in the opposite direction to the solvent vapor to create a permanently cold surface on which the vapor can condense. And then the condensed solvent drips into the flask. And this is our conical flask and our solvent that we're collecting is pure and it's called a distillate. Now this process, we use it when we, are, when we want to separate and retain the solvent from a solution. Solvent from like a solution with a solid solute and a solvent like salt water something that won't decompose on heating. So we'll get our solute remaining in the container. And you know, this is applied on a large scale basis um, to actually remove um, salt from seawater. So persons can have portable drinking water, well, portable water, that's redundant because portable means it's drink, you can drink it. Portable water in like the, the, the Middle East where, or areas where there, there, there isn't much rainfall. We're going to go through the other diagram, um, fractional distillation. Then we're going to look at um, the extraction of sucrose from sugarcane. Now, for the other one, um, for fractional distillation, this one, fractional, it's telling us that something is present in some, some fractions, or you know, you have fractional components. Fraction from primary school you learn is the, is a fraction is a part of a whole. So you may have several fractions making up one component. For example, air is a mixture of gases. Nitrogen is 70 odd percent of air. But we're not really focusing on air today, even though you can have the fractional distillation of air. But fractional distillation, so miscible liquids, they mix. But it's not a matter of them just mixing. They mix well and their boiling points are close together. All right. For example, ethanol and water, 78, a boiling point of 78 and a boiling point of 100. So the miscible liquids mix completely, but they're separated due to their different boiling points. So the, which one do you think would be separated first? If you're, heating the, if you're heating a mixture of ethanol and water, 
which boiling point are you going to arrive at first in the heating process? You know, the reason 78, if we're going up in temperature, or yeah, we increase in the heat energy, we're going to reach 78 before we, we reach um, 100. So that is exactly what will um, happen. When we reach 78, this is what will happen. The temperature will hold at 78 until all the ethanol that is present in the mixture has boiled off. We have our ethanol and water mixture. Like a hand sanitizer, we could actually separate the, the, the alcohol from the water in hand sanitizer. So this is our mixture. We could say it's ethanol and water. Ethanol is the lower boiling point, as you pointed out earlier. So we would reach the ethanol's boiling point first. But before all of that, while we heat the mixture, the mixture boils and the vapor of both liquids enter. We have what we call a fractionating column. This is similar to the, the one for simple distillation, except we realize that up here we have a column. So in the column now, we, we not only just have a column, but we have the column containing glass beads. And the whole point there is to provide a large surface area. So you can have condensation occurring and evaporation occurring and condensation occurring and evaporation occurring all over and over again. All right. So the liquid will heat up. The vapors will boil. Well, the, the mixture boils and the vapors of both liquids will enter the fractionating column. That's the only way of escape. So when the vapors of the liquid with the higher boiling points condense, seize, well, condenses in the fractionating column, the liquids will drop back down. So you have boiling and cooling and the liquids keep boiling and cooling and boiling and cooling. So the vapor of the liquid with the lower boiling point eventually reaches the top of the fractionating column and it, enter, and it enters um, the condenser, all right? So the one that has a lower boiling point is the one that actually, it goes, it reaches to the top first. It has a lower boiling point, so it will, it will boil quicker and cool quicker, and it will go back up. It will continue boiling, and it will boil until it reaches the top. It will vaporize. It will keep, um, evaporation will occur uh, the, until it reaches the top. When it reaches the top, um, there is no um, way, there's, the only escape is for it to go over to the right side where we have that tube leading out into our, um, the tube where we have the condenser um, wrapping around that. All right, so the, the thermometer is here to ensure that the temperature of the vapor entering the condenser remains constant. So while we have ethanol coming off, the temperature is going to be stuck at 78. So we know that that's the boiling point of ethanol. We only have ethanol coming off. All right. When the boiling point starts to increase, we will now change the container over the right side because it means that the other liquid, the other liquid or the liquid with the higher boiling point has no, you know, has no, you know, it's it's now coming over. All right. So that is this is pretty much um what we what the, the process entails. The rest of it with the condens the condenser is just like before. We cut we collect our distillate. That's the, the distillate with the lower boiling point first. And if it were several, um, if it were several um, different fractions, we, we could just use different containers to collect them at different temperatures. But for simplicity purposes, we just look at um, one that has two. Um, for the um, on a large scale application, they use um, the crude oil can be distilled into several fractions to get you many different components: gasoline, kerosene um and other things all right so this is this is what the this one looks like um the major difference here is the fractionating column that has glass beads providing a large surface area and i believe it would be great for us to actually um do this in the um in the in the lab to actually see it at, at play and not just look at the diagram all right so gonna pause here. I need some feedback before I move on though. Any questions, folks? Is an outline of the extraction of sucrose from sugar cane. So the cane enters the factory. Where I live, I see the cane trucks passing. There's a feeder table where the cane is cut by roti, a series of rotating knives. All right. So that gives us small pieces of cane. Then it passes through the roller mills where the cane is crushed 
water is sprayed on and the whole point of water being sprayed on is to wash out or to extract the juice from the from the the, the, the fiber of the um the, the the cane similar to us when we're eating cane our mouth we salivate and the water helps to to extract the juice from the cane now we get two things from this we get trash cane trash which is cane fiber aka bagas all of it is not necessarily burned some of it can be used to make bagas board uh, the rest of it goes to the furnace where you know, it is burned and it's used to heat water from which um, steam is generated, which is used to generate electricity. The juice is what's important to us. That's what we need. So from the roller mill, we get the dilute juice and the juice around there is um, about 16%. So it's fresh. So they would need to eventually get it concentrated down. But before they have to do what we call the clarification. So they add lime, that's calcium hydroxide. They add it and two things here. It's to precipitate out the impurities so that the impurities can settle out. And it's also to neutralize the acidic juice to prevent the sucrose from breaking down into glucose and fructose. So from this clarification or this cleaning out process, you will get the clear juice and you will get the muddy impurity. Now let's look at what they do with the muddy impurities. First, the muddy impurities, they filter it further and they wash it again to get all the sugar they can get from the mud. They don't want to waste anything. Then the mud now is returned to the fields to help with the fertilization. The clear juice goes to what we call the boilers or the evaporators. So in the process, you could put boiler or evaporators here because that's what happens. The juice is concentrated. It's like when you're cooking, you're making um, stew, like stew chicken, stew pork, and your gravy is too long, and you have to let it simmer down to get a little more concentrated. Yeah, or thick, you know, that's what's happening here. So the juice is concentrated, and this is done by heating it in a series of boilers, one after the other, under reduced pressure. The pressure has to be low so that it doesn't boil at too high a temperature because if they boil it at too high a temperature, the sugar is going to burn up and you're going to end up with burned sugar. You're going to end up with browning instead of molasses and crystals. And I, I oftentimes wonder if right here, if there was some malfunction in our persons probably heated or boiled the sugar at too high a temperature and cause the sugar to be burned and the meat. I wonder if that's how they came up on browning. We need to do some research to see how browning was invented, if it was an accident, if it was just, you know, some things going, gone bad in the um, boiling or the evaporating um, process. So after this, we will get our syrup, which is concentrated cane juice. And from here, it goes on to the vacuum pan or what we call um, yeah, the vacuum pan, that's pretty much it. So the syrup is crystallized here at low pressure. So they normally add um, a solution of crisp, um, sucrose, you know, to help the crystals that they're adding here are helping the other crystals in the um, concentrated juice to crystallize out. So after this now, we're going to spin this at high speed because what we have here is what you call the mass circuit, which is really sugar crystals and molasses so we want to separate the molasses from the sugar crystals so the centrifuge does that and that's where it is spun at um several hundred um, um times gravity the molasses return is returned for crystallization for further crystallization because the idea is to get as high a yield as possible as much sugar crystal as possible so the molasses goes back to the vacuum pan for crystallization and um the solid from it the crystals from it that's separated and um that's collected at different at different um point so you call that unrefined sugar which is sold on the local market or it is exported after they've crystallized all they can get from the molasses the molasses is passed on to another part of the, the factory that we're not concerned about as children as students in school um that's where um it can undergo fermentation to give rum you know alcohol animal feed and one of the things that they use molasses to do well molasses is rich in iron and several other nutrients 
So when ladies are pregnant, they 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 they, they are encouraged to to drink molasses to put molasses in their porridge because you know it's a good source of iron. Farmers will use the molasses to make drenches for their animals. And by drenches, we're talking like a tonic when they want the animals to bulk up, when they want the animals to put on weight. So you buy a little cow, a little calf, and you want to grow him. Your parents want to grow him to help to, you know, pay your school fee for university. So they give him a drench. It's like a tonic to help him put on weight and all of that. So the molasses is rich in um, nutrients like that. All right, so this is where we'll say couple later for now. Again, thank you for joining Kim with Kim. Please like if you found value, share with a friend and consider subscribing. Also leave your comments on what you thought about this video. Couple later.